You heard it? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me, Dr. Bevins. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. And if you, if you could just talk about your background, your education, um, a little bit about your career and your areas of expertise, just to help our listeners kind of understand where you're coming from and, and what you're here to talk about. Okay, sure. Thanks. And thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name's Dr. Rebecca Bevins. Um, I have a PhD in cognitive neuroscience, uh, which is brain, body perception, how our physiological states affect um, our psychological perception. Uh, and I also have a master's degree in child development, human development, you know, really focusing on early childhood development. So that's, you know, the background that I have. Uh, unfortunately, um, I am now an expert in artificial food dyes. I, I say unfortunate because I never set out to be an expert in this area. Uh, don't want to be an expert in this area, but was kind of forced into this uh, because our son was having some severe problems and I had to figure out what was going on with him. And so we, through the years, uh, went down the rabbit hole of understanding what food dyes are and what they potentially can do to some people. And uh, I've since been up on the research uh, and, and involved in a lot of the things across the country when it comes to uh, food dye legislation. And, and we're actually conducting some research um, this semester, this year with some of my students um, who really got involved and wanted to get involved. So, so that's you know why I'm here, but I do have a background in, in kiddos and humans and, and how, how what we, how our, our, how our neurology and our hormones and everything affect how we see the world. That's very interesting. Is that what you're teaching at Western Nevada College? Yes. Yeah, so I teach basic psych 101, uh, which I love teaching that class, and abnormal psychology, child psychology, adolescent psychology. Uh, I've taught research methods, uh, taught, oh, so social psychology. So taught a lot of the different courses and um, yeah, just continue to teach a variety of courses every semester, but psych, psych based for sure. Yeah, it's, it seems like a great base for uh, looking into these things because I think, it, it, at least in our case, we mistaked or still mistake the reaction that our son has from food dye um, mm -hmm. for like a psychological or a behavioral issue. Is that is that typical? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, our son, we... He was always this like hyperactive kid. Now, mind you, he didn't eat food dyes for at least the first two years of his life. Uh, it was probably around year three. I mean, I made all of his baby food and, you know, just all of it. And so it was probably around year three where he was eating the things that a lot of kids eat, going to preschool, uh, snacks, things that have color in them. Never, it never occurred to me. And, but he was always this hyperactive kid. And, um, and it just got progressively worse and worse. So for years, and this is the guilt that I will probably carry with me for the rest of my life. For years, we treated him as if he had a behavioral issue and not a physical issue. And so we tried behavior modification. We, we tried all the things. He went to therapy. We, we really did until he was seven. So for four years, we really did kind of in a way blame the kid for the, the problem and and it's like somebody who's on meth you can't treat them until they stop taking meth and here we are trying to train this child not to have these behavioral issues when he was ingesting something that was literally causing the behavioral issues so it is it is common uh it, it can be common for them to get rashes um, ear infections. He had three, I had 10 ear infections in nine months. Um, and then we ended up with tubes in his ears going back, looking back, uh, 
I bet you if we had pulled him off of the dyes when he was three or if he never had them, he would not have developed that issue. Uh, but um, some kids have physical issues, but it's really the behavioral issues where you're going to see the the reactions and, and the issues. So yeah, it, it is kind of hard. And it was kind of hard for him to identify, is this a real, am I really mad? Or is it because I had yellow, yellow five or six, and I hate the world now and I hate everybody in it, but he always felt kind of justified in hating the world and hating everybody in it. So it was hard for him. It took years. That was the most difficult one. It took him years to understand how a dye reaction feels for yellow. Red was easy for him. Red felt like ADHD and the not being able to focus and the brain buzzing and and uh, green made him manic. And um, he still says blue doesn't do anything to him, but I think it makes him grumpy, but yeah, uh, nothing, you know, grumpy isn't a disorder. So we let it go. But really the red and the yellow and the green are, are issues for him. But yeah, yellow was very, very difficult for him to recognize. Um, I figured out last summer that I'm, re I'm reactive, not to the level that he is, but I'm reactive. I was on a medication that had red and yellow in it. And I was on it for eight years and we had removed all the colors from our house, but I was still taking that pill every day. And I got the pill from the pharmacy, but it had natural colors in it instead, iron oxide. And I watched my anxiety dissipate and it was easier for me to calm my mind and um, just a lot of different mental, like my anxiety level dropped and a lot of physiological, like psychological changes for me happened. And so I lived my entire life thinking that my level of anxiety was like normal and, and this is just who I was. So, you know, here I was at 52 having this existential crisis of like, oh my gosh, who am I? Um, turns out I am the same person, just a little less anxious and, uh, and clearer focused and less angry. And I don't have, I don't, I don't snap the same way as I used to. And when I got overloaded and, and uh, regrettably, I wish I would have figured it out a long time ago, but it, it is, I guess what it is, but so everyone reacts a little differently. And because of that, you know, looking at the different behaviors, even kids and yes, kids have natural meltdowns. I mean, you know, little kiddos have meltdowns when they have that communication issue, you know, their brain's going, they understand far more than they can communicate. And sometimes they don't understand what they're feeling. And, and so they have these, like these meltdowns. And, and when parents talk about their kids having die reactions, these are go uh, like, you know, they go above and beyond a typical toddler meltdown. And they just, it's, it's outside that realm of, of normality or, or that typical reaction. And so, so yes, long answer is yes. It's, it's very, very psychological. So I, I saw a Ted talk that you gave. Yeah. Uh, I think it was eight years ago. And one of the, um, most impactful things that that my wife and I took from it was the chart that you had created where you had observed what the different colors, mm -hmm. um, how they impacted your son. And I just wonder how long did it take you to figure that out? And and what what were the the steps you took to really kind of get get those colors defined? So when he was seven, he was having some issues and, uh, he's having issues with school. So, um, uh, he was coming home, not being able to focus his kindergarten teacher, his first grade teacher were wonderful. A second grade teacher was by the book. She wasn't giving him anything outside. So he had to do everything the other students had done. Uh, and the other teachers before were, were kind of challenging him with different work. And so he was kind of bored, but he was starting to have these really bad meltdowns after school. And I asked him one day if he could just 
focus for me. Like, but just focus and do this homework. I know you can do this. Just focus. And he said, I can't focus. My brain buzzes. And so having that neuroscience degree, I know that brains don't buzz. There shouldn't. They should not buzz. <laughs> right. Uh, neuroscience 101. Brains do not buzz. And so I started to do research and look into like what's going on here. And I found, and I, I wish I could find this, this girl, she was about 16 at the time. And this was around mm, 2015 and no, to, earlier than that, 2012. And she had a blog and in the blog, she said that red 40 made her brain buzz. So I, I, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is the, this is it. Cause this is the only, all, all the literature I found nothing had said that. So, and I couldn't find really, I saw stuff on red 40, but none of the other colors. So we pulled them off red 40, brain buzzing went away. A lot of the ADHD behaviors went away. And by ADHD behaviors, I mean the inattentiveness, the inability to sit still, the blurting out, the just a lot of the things that we attribute to ADHD. And he has been since tested. He does not have ADHD, but he was really exhibiting behaviors like ADHD that went away. And so for whatever reason, we felt that red was the problem. We left him on everything else. And then we went about our lives. And then over the next six months, instead of eating any red candy, which he loved, he would go to the yellow. And we were in Hawaii that summer because we did this in December with the move, removing red. So we did that in July. We were in, uh, we were in Hawaii and he was doing the shaved ice and he was getting the yellow, yellow syrup full of color. And by the end of that trip, by the time we got back, that poor kid was having you know, five meltdowns a day, just over the top. Um, and that was when he started to, to beg me to get him a knife so he could kill himself because he didn't want to live anymore. It was just... In hindsight, it wasn't that he wanted to die. It was just, he did not want to live like that anymore. He was just so overwhelmed and so emotionally overwhelmed. And, and so we pulled all the dyes away, so just pulled them all like one night, just pulled them all. And after he recovered, because he crashed pretty hardcore and it took three months for him to physically recover completely. And then six months for him to kind of psychologically recover. So after several months, uh, we kind of decided to test it. Really what, what got was, got us was when he, we were at Thai, we were at, again, Thai food and he wanted some green tea ice cream and it had green in it. And I was like, well, it's Friday. <laughs> Let's test it. Right. I'm a researcher. So he ate it. And by the time we got home, cause he assured me that green does nothing. Right. So by the time we got home, the kids bouncing off the walls, so high. I mean, just manic beyond belief. Mom, want to play catch? Want to play catch? Mom, hey, mom, 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 mom. It's like, oh, oh, we just stood there like, holy cow. So wrote down, you know, okay, green does this. And the next day um, when he woke up, I asked him, I'm like, you're going to eat green again? Oh, no, no, no. So he felt it. So then... We would wait another few months. And then over the summer, we would play, let's test this. <laughs> and so giving him, you know, red, double blind controlled, uh, dad, dad knew what it was. I didn't, or I knew what it was. Dad didn't. And he would take it. And then we would watch for behaviors and, or the fun, um, why are you melting down? Because I asked you to vacuum or no, I asked you to stop vacuuming. So why are you melting down over stopping vacuuming? And then I would look and we would see that the day before the cheeseburger that he had at DQ had yellow in it because the cheese has yellow. And we're like, there, there it is. Right. So, so a couple different ways, <laughs> double blind for all of us had no idea the kid ate, ate color. And, and so through that process is when we started to see what behaviors came with what color, uh, Apparently, we're the only people that ever did this. Researchers have never done this. Met with a bunch of researchers when California did their um, their symposium in 2019. Uh, the Office of Health Hazard Assessment held a symposium. Researchers from around the country and the world came and presented information for two days. And he was the only kiddo there. 
that was die reactive. He was 13 at the time. He did stand up and speak uh, and talk to a lot of the researchers and a lot of the pediatricians. And they all went, mm, we never thought about testing one die or the other, because essentially kids eat all the dice, right? You, you pour a bowl of Fruit Loops and you're getting them all. So they really never kind of broke down what die does what. So <clears throat> we were the first ones to do that. And there's still no research on it besides our anecdotal research with our kid. So that's how we kind of figured out. I have talked to thousands of parents in the last eight years. And a lot of them support the same pattern of behavior that we see. Although some say blue affects their child intensely. And so different dyes have different intensities for the kids. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, so, so as a general rule, those seem to be kind of stable across a lot of, of different children of the different dyes do different things, but it is just kind of remove, recover, and then reintroduce and then see what the behavior is and then remove it again. If there is a behavior. What is it about the dyes? that makes them so harmful or impactful? I wish we knew for sure, but there has been no research in investigating what it does in the human body. So we, we don't know what happens in the human body with, with these, these chemicals, they are petroleum based and we don't know what they break down into. We don't even know if they break down. So red, green and blue stay whole and usually come out the way they go in. Uh, you can give a little white mouse a bunch of blue and their little hands and feet turn blue. We don't know what red and yellow do. They, they are of a class of azo dyes. Uh, although last year, NPR ran a story about a woman, a nurse, who was sweating pink, staining her clothes, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And then they found that uh, my husband comes flying home one day, so excited to tell me what he heard because uh, because they found that she was sweating Red 40. The chips that she was eating had high amounts of Red 40 in them. She was eating a large amount of these tomato something chips. And so she was sweating Red 40. So to me and other researchers that says, well, it stays whole too and ends up in your lymphatic system and out your sweat glands and it's so that was a really kind of an interesting little bit of information but there's no research on what these do they are assumed safe by the fda assumed safe there's been no testing to prove that they're safe the testing all happened before the 80s and in reading a lot of the research, I can see where some of them went wrong. Like why, why they weren't finding results. For one, back in the 80s, we use 500% more artificial color now than we did in the 80s. And that's it's easy to find. All dyes have to be batch tested in order to be used. And so you can look up how much has been batch tested each quarter. And so last year, uh, I found that there was over 5,700,000 pounds of red 40 that was batch tested for use. That's just red 40. That's not red 40 lake. All the lakes are oil soluble. Red 40 is water soluble. So there is some rat research demonstrating that it does affect, it could affect their immune system. There is some research that isn't published that I'm hoping it does get published where a graduate student found that the dyes interfere with the, the functioning of the macrophages in the brain. So interrupting the immune system in the brain. Um, but we, we don't know. There's recent research just came out uh, last year that rats with a specifically compromised immune system. So they alter their immune system in a very specific way and they, give them red 40, they will develop colitis. And if they address the immune system issue, the colitis goes away. So 
could very well explain why we have this explosion of colitis in in this country, especially. We don't see it in other countries. I, I was in the UK. It was fantastic. Their food does not contain food dyes. And if it does, it's got a warning label on it that it will cause it may cause behavioral effects in children. And so a lot of companies just stay away from adding food colors. So it was, it was great. I had no issues while I was there, um, food wise and, and, and physically, but, um, but yeah, we don't know. We don't know. There needs to be more research, but the government isn't funding any, any research into why or how these chemicals affect the body. Some researchers guess that they're endocrine disruptors. And we've been hearing a lot about endocrine disruptors in the news and which is why affecting children is such a huge deal because they're developing still, they're still growing. Their brains are still growing. They're still learning behaviors. They're still, you know, they're, they're just still developing and we're interrupting that development every time that we add in a dye, if they're reacting now, do all kids react? No, they don't. But how do you know if your kid's reacting? How do you know if you're reacting unless you remove it completely from your diet for a couple of weeks? There's no test. Unfortunately, you can't go get a blood test, you know, whatever. There's none of that yet. Um, maybe one day when they recognize that this actually is a problem. Um, but, but we don't know. We don't know how or what it does to the brain and the body. And, and that's worrisome. Like here, eat this. We don't know what it does to you, but eat this. Uh, no. What do you think other countries know that we don't? If, if, for instance, you, you mentioned the United Kingdom, if there's nothing, if they're not putting artificial food dyes in their food, what do they, what do they know that we don't? And you know. So in 2010, 2012, Dr. Stevens did, Stevenson did a couple studies, conducted a few studies. The Southampton study is what they call it where he investigated um the, the protocol was they would they had a group of children they brought them in and on monday they either gave them they gave them something to drink either was natural color or artificial color and the kids didn't know and then the parents charted their behaviors over the next five days and then the next monday they would come in and they would give them a different color or different thing and they would you know they did that for i think six or eight weeks and then at the end, they compared behavioral changes with the natural colors versus the artificial colors, and they found an effect. And from that, they assumed that from their sample size, they assumed that about five to 7% of children react to artificial food dyes, which was higher than my original, in my TED talk, I assumed 1% as a very safe number. So we're talking up to five to 7% or more uh, when I talked to, to Dr. Stevenson, um, I said, I, I'm really happy that you did the seven days in between because, and they, and they had a dye-free diet at home. They, they stuck to strictly dye-free diet. And so the only dye they were getting on is on Monday, because what we have found is with our, our son, yellow stays in his system for up to five days. So if you ate yellow Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, by Friday, woo! you have a high concentration in your system and and that's when you see these these massive reactions so there is a carryover effect so their study was was great now why is the united states not recognizing it because they used two colors that were eu approved but not approved by the fda so the fda said well they used two colors that aren't approved by the united states so we're going to ignore this entire entire study um now they're the the EU, the Euro, European Union, and they were part of the European Union at the time. It's before Brexit. They have a different approach to government, and they put people first over corporations, and so they are about protecting the people, and then the corporations had to adjust. In the United States, unfortunately, corporations often come before people. And so the FDA doesn't want to put into place removing color and forcing these companies because a lot of the companies, they don't want to do it. There is a hard lobbying 
And we saw it in California when California tried to pass the the uh, removing red three and th three other chemicals. And uh, and so companies push back. And in this country, companies are often heard and people aren't. So I, I wish, I wish that we had as much of a focus on our people here that that the UK does. The UK and, and the European Union ban over 200 chemicals that we allow in our foods. So their ingredients list for the same products are much, much smaller. They also have far less sugar and far, far less salt in their foods. Their milk isn't sweet like ours is. My, their milk tastes like milk. It's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> when we came back, my son grabbed a glass of milk and was like, whoa, so sweet. Because over those two weeks, we got used to not having as much sugar in foods all of their, their foods don't have a lot of sugar or, um, or sodium in it. So they just have a different approach. So here they want the public to put the pressure on companies, which has happened. Is there it's a been, price mm. differential between artificial and <clears throat> natural food coloring? Is that part of the problem? Well, uh, well, okay. So in defense of the companies here. So we have no, uh, so our artificial food guys, the synthetic food colors are, are temperature and pH stable. So they can add them to things that are acidic or basic, uh, high temperature, low temperature. They can do all of that and it will, um, it'll be fine. It won't lose its color. Natural colors break down. Natural colors aren't temperature stable or pH stable necessarily. So if you're making ice cream, fine, that's easy. But if you're baking cupcakes, you can't add beet powder to cupcakes and expect them to come out pink. They come out really ugly. So uh, so we don't have a perfect one-to-one. -one. Now, my chroma is working on a perfect one-to-one -one, and that is made from uh, fungi. And that is going to be hitting the market in the next couple of years. And that will be a huge game changer. So I, I can understand why companies don't necessarily want to remove. They're going to have to change their practices. Yes, you can put a drop of red in versus having to put in different powders and things. Um, on the other hand, too, the American public has also gotten extremely used to very bright foods and unnaturally bright. And, and so there's a pushback. So when tricks removed artificial colors from their cereal they uh the the public complained on it was a social media complaint and they put the colors back in but having said that pickles pickles was a number one issue with us because they contained yellow it's just weird they put yellow in there to make them look pretty i guess and i used to have to go to three different stores to get pickles uh because pickle relish also notorious for having colors in it. And two years ago, uh, I was at our local grocery store, Smith's, which is a Kroger brand, Kroger's across the country. And in front of me, there was every single type of pickle you could ever imagine. And all of them on the front said no synthetic colors. So short of, you know, why is this grown woman like in tears standing here? taking pictures and super excited and crying in the supermarket. I know it would be crazy, but um, I'm sending them to my son, like pickles, pickles, look, 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 look. And they were not any more expensive. They were actually cheaper than any of the other brands. So that was wonderful. I, I can't do gluten. My mom is celiac. I'm borderline. So I pay the gluten-free tax. I know it's, it, everything's twice as much in Europe. It was not, it was very interesting, but here it's twice as much for gluten-free stuff I get. And, but, but I haven't seen that kind of differential when they use natural colors in products that natural colors can be used. So again, in pickles, you can use turmeric and it makes it just as pretty yellow as, as the yellow five or six, uh, uh, Baskin Robbins pulled the color out of their ice cream. They did so in 2018. So this is nothing new. They never told anyone. They had a little sign on the front door and it was this little typed out 
sign, letting us, you know, letter, letting all the people that come in know that their, their ice cream no longer had any artificial colors in it. Now, my girlfriend calls me like screaming. My husband and I race down to Baskin Robbins and we're like, are you kidding? Okay. You're serious. Cause so, cause we couldn't take our kid to Baskin Robbins. It was like, Ooh, look at all these flavors. You can have one. Um, so we, you know, can we look at the ingredients list? Can, can we look at the ingredients list? And so they're showing us all these buckets of ice cream. And we went home and grabbed the kid after school and brought him down there. And we're like, have whatever you want. I'm crying. He's about crying. I mean, it's the silliest little things, but when you've, when you've got a kid who's allergic to something and then now all of a sudden it's not there anymore, he, he had the opportunity to go and enjoy whatever ice cream he wanted. Um, and, uh, and, and so companies are becoming aware they're starting to remove it. There are so many options now compared to eight years ago. Gosh, how many years it's been? Well, he'll be, he'll be 19 tomorrow. And he was seven. So 12 years, it was right before he turned eight. So 11 and a half years, 11 years, 11 and a half that we've been on this playing this game. And now is so much easier to find things without color. So uh, Burger King removed all the colors. McDonald's came out and said they moved, removed colors from a lot of things. Um, who else? Wendy's, West Coast Wendy's doesn't have color in anything except some of their drinks. I mean, we have to be careful with drinks, but but yeah, there's so many more options now all over. So companies know. And the reason that companies know is because people are shifting to being more aware. And, and it's kind of like voting with your wallet, right? When you buy products that don't have color in them and those are better sellers than the ones that have color in them, they stop making the ones with color. So, so people are coming more aware. What do you think the shift is from? Are people just figuring it out? They're noticing more um, behavioral issues with their kids or, or is there a, you know, folks like you who are you know mm-hmm. trying to bring awareness is, Yes. Yeah, so, well, so the Center for the Science and the Public Interest have been working on this issue for a very long time. They work with companies. When I uh, did my TED talk, I was hoping to help one, if I helped one kid, if I helped one family not go through what we went through, it was a win. Uh, my talk now has over 400,000 views. A couple years ago, it blew up on TikTok. Uh, I wasn't on TikTok and I'm getting these texts from my friends. Oh my God, you're all over TikTok. I'm like, I'm not on TikTok. And they're like, no, your talk's all over TikTok. Uh, My students were like thrilled. Oh, you're on TikTok. My professor's on TikTok. Someone took my TED talk and broke it up into pieces. And last I checked, which was, oh my gosh, probably eight months ago, there were over 80 videos with my TED talk with over like 30, 40 million views at that point. Um, There is a documentary coming out and uh, the woman that, the the, the couple who who are doing it, they saw my my TED talk removed dice from their kiddo. Um, There are people who've been in the news. They saw my talk. And so they removed it. Uh, the people that are doing the documentary, uh, to die for the documentary, they started a Facebook page. And I remember when there was like, I don't know, 500 people on it. There's over 500,000 people in the Facebook page. Die free family swaps, resource, or recipes swaps and resources. And a lot of people, the feedback is for one word of mouth, two people saw something on, you know, social media. And so there's becoming this more global awareness or this, this awareness in this country that colors can have an effect for some people. Now it doesn't affect everyone. I get people all the time. Well, it doesn't bother me. Well, you know what? I can eat peanuts. 
but if my cousin eats peanuts, she dies, right? Okay, so I get it. Not everybody's allergic to peanuts, but for those that are, it's a problem. Not everyone's allergic to colors, but for those who are, it's a problem. So I think it's just, it's out there more. And in social media, as wonderful, I mean, as terrible as it can be sometimes, it, it can be also very wonderful. And so there's been a, a, sh a sharing and spreading of awareness. Uh, and we're just, we're getting there. California, California is pushing right now, AB uh, 2316 is a bill that calls to remove all artificial synthetic food dyes from children's school foods. That has passed every single committee that it has been in. It's going to the full committee here soon, full Senate. Um, I may have to, I'm, I may be called to go testify. I may not, but it's been, it's been passing. So that's huge. Getting red three removed. When that one is a known carcinogen, the FDA knew back in the eighties, it was a carcinogen. They removed it from cosmetics, but not food. And you can find it in Pedialyte. So I don't, I just don't understand that, but, but people are becoming more aware. And I think people are becoming more conscious of what's in our foods, what's out there. And there's, as generations go, they're becoming a little less trusting of what the government says is safe versus what is actually safe. I thought, well, the FDA says it's safe, it's safe. It's not safe for everybody. What are some of the common misconceptions people have about artificial food dyes? Well, that's a good one. Um, gosh, there was a really interesting thing that was going around at the beginning of the summer that your watermelon was all dyed red. Like farmers go around and inject all watermelons with red 40. Um, no, no, no. Um, I think people people are so far removed from their food supply that they don't understand that dyes are meant to mimic natural colors, the natural vibrancy of fruits and vegetables and things. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that it can cause problems in some people. I still get treated like I'm crazy or I'm making it up or I'm some crazy, um, you know, some crazy mom that that avoids everything. I'm like, no, we have everything from organic to Oreos in our house. Like, trust me, like we've, if it wasn't for the fact that it caused issues with my son and myself, I, we probably would have it in our house, but, um, but it does. So we don't. So I just don't think people completely understand that the FDA doesn't test things really. They're, they rely on companies to police themselves and they rely on consumers to buy the products that they want, but there's very little education. There is an allowable daily limit of food dyes, but the number doesn't matter because you don't know how much dye is in what food. So you couldn't do the math yourself to figure out if you're eating more than the allowable daily limit or not. Um, so people just, I just don't think they completely understand what dyes are and why it could be a problem. And, and the other thing too, is if it causes anger issues in people that can have an effect on you, even if dye doesn't affect, let's say it doesn't affect me, but my neighbor decides to throw a fit and hurt people. Now it affects me. So we do have this, like cultural issue around colors uh, and and needing to better understand what they can and cannot do, what, what chemicals can and cannot do. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what else we're missing on that one other than just a general basic understanding of they don't provide any nutrients. They don't change the flavor. They don't add anything except color. And to us, when we see something colorful, we assume it's healthy. And when it's not colorful, we think it's unhealthy. And 
And then a lot of companies just use color in place of actually healthy ingredients. What do you think some of the long-term effects are of extended exposures to artificial food dyes could be? Decreased quality of life. I look back at my, you know, 52 years when I was sitting there having my little existential crisis. And I look back at my high school years and this was in the eighties. So I probably wasn't consuming nearly as much as the kids are now, but there were still dyes and stuff. And I was a hot mess in high school. I mean, a lot of high schoolers are, but I was a hot mess in high school. <laughs> and I've had uh, the emotional ups and downs and the roller coaster. And my doctor tried to diagnose me as bipolar. I'm like, not bipolar. And, but I was having high highs and low lows. And I, I look back and wonder how much of that was what I was eating just from what I was eating. How much of the, the chaos in my head, the inability to calm myself down, the inability to be at peace, the anxiety level, again, that I thought was normal. I had someone like, like there is no normal anxiety level. I'm like, but I always felt mine was normal because it was normal for me. But was it? No, it wasn't because that anxiety level dissipated. So really it affects our quality of life. Uh, I had a, a student who was talking about his anger and feeling angry inside all the time and not knowing why. And so like halfway through the semester, cause I talk about dyes a lot and uh, he removed the dyes from his diet and he said that he could sit outside and stare at the stars and was at peace and wasn't angry. And it felt wonderful. And, and here he is 19, 20. And then accidentally ate something with color in it. And then felt terrible again. And was like, yeah, that's it. And now does everything he can to avoid it. And is feeling better. How many of our school shooters? How many... How, how many people out there who have hurt other people were just raging because of eating a bunch of Cheetos over us an extended period of time. And that anger just builds up. So when my kiddo eats yellow five or six, he would get really angry and he, his body would get hot and his mind would race. And I asked him like, what, like your mind's racing, like what? And he goes, mom, all the thoughts you could possibly think have already gone through my head. And, and he would, but he always felt justified in that anger. And it took him, like I said, years to figure out how to gauge it. And he's still not a hundred percent. So it was, oh gosh, I think he was like 17, 16, 17, 17. And he ate a, an eclair from the bakery and I didn't check the pastry cream. Sure enough, yellow five. Well, I didn't even think until the kids in my face. Now he's like six, one, 200 pounds. And he's in my face and he's just angry and arguing with me over the stupidest thing. Like, I don't even remember what it was. It was just the dumbest thing. And for a second, I was scared and I've never been afraid of him. It's one thing to grab a seven-year-old, but it's another when you've got a kid that is bigger than you. And it just occurred to me, holy cow. He could be raging. And what if he's 24 years old in a bar and he turns and just beats the crap out of someone? And now we've got a serious problem that someone's hurt because of it. And uh, so we've had long talks about, you know, you're going to have to recognize this. So the last couple of years, he's been really, really good at, at recognizing when he accidentally gets dosed because it's it'll happen and and not taking it out but that accidental one dose 
is very different than every single day of feeling that way over and over and over and for an extended period of time. And then you're just raging against the world and you forget what it's like to not feel that rage and that anger. And, 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 and it's, it, so it has an effect. Not only that, we noticed with the kiddo when he stopped at seven, we had an emotional catch up to do. We had a, a, we had a learning curve because if you look at someone who's, let's say, high on meth, when they start doing drugs, you're not learning from your environment. You're not learning different behaviors. You're not, we're, we're constantly learning soft skills. We're constantly learning how to control ourselves or, you know, you say something wrong and you learn how to apologize or like when you're high, you don't, you don't learn a lot of those things. Same with your, if you're drinking all the time, you're not learning. So now we have a three to seven-year-old who wasn't learning a lot of the things that typical three and seven-year-olds do on a psychological level. He can do math, he can do English, he can do all those things, but on a psychological and an emotional level, he wasn't learning. And so we watched him spend six months to a year catching up to where his peers were in that respect. So we're stunting their growths, their emotional growths. When, when you've got a kiddo who is dye reactive and they're consuming those dyes, you, you, you stunt them until they stop. And then they can start to that, that developmental growth again, that cognitive growth, all those lessons that kids learn on a daily basis, they just aren't learning them. So there is some long-term ramifications a lot of people focus on kids and and yes i focused on kids and i started out with kids because i had a kid and really again kids are really affected because they're little and they're developing and they're growing and their brains are growing but adults are still affected and these kiddos turn into adults i had a couple uh researchers tell me that they they are assuming that about 50% of these kids grow out of it during puberty. So we prayed and like, (laughs) cross our fingers and oh, please, 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 please be part of the 50%. No dice. Nope. Nope. So is that really a number? We don't know. Uh, I always tell my students, whenever anybody says 50%, this 50% that it means they don't know. (laughs) It's a nice number. And let's pretend that works. But that means 50% of these kids grow out of it. That means 50% don't. And they become adults who are still die reactive. And we spend a far more time as adults than we do as kids. And we're still reacting. We're still having, having issues. And it still affects us on a daily basis. Is it causing colitis in some people? It's a good question. IBS, intestinal issues. It might. I have had adults tell me that it caused tinnitus that brain buzzing my son talked about, uh, seizures. Um, so epilepsy stops, not all, I'm never going to say all, but some people, uh, people that have been diagnosed with ADHD incorrectly, it was actually a dye reaction and not an actual brain disorder, brain abnormality, a neurotypical brain development. So There are people being misdiagnosed and put on medications. I had a colleague come up to me. She's been eight years now. They've been trying to figure out her intestinal stuff. Eight years. It turns out that the medication that she was put on to help some of the stuff had blue one in it. And it was the blue one that was causing the the gut issues. Because medication was for something else. But yes, they kept her on a medication for her gut issues that were actually causing the gut issues. So there's a lot of medications out there that contain colors. Kids that have ADHD are being treated with medications that have color. Well, do they really have ADHD or are they having a color reaction that now is guaranteed daily because they're taking a pill? So there is long-term issues. And I don't think that we're really, we're not really talking about that. It, 
we're, I don't know if we're at the stage of talking about that, but I'm going to start talking about it because sooner or later people will catch up and then other people will be with me like you and we'll have this conversation in a bigger level of like, hey, uh, how many of us are affected? How many of us are are having issues that, poof, can disappear just by removing it from your diet? And it's inconvenient. Yeah, but it's so much easier now. So much easier. It's easier to remove dyes than it is to be gluten-free. <laughs> I can say that from personal experience. So, and it and it's just going to get easier because there's a lot of companies out there that are, like I said before, removing it. And so it's easier to navigate that dye-free lifestyle. And you don't have to give up. If you want to eat garbage you can eat garbage. There's plenty of garbage that doesn't help. You, know? you don't have to go all organic and 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 uh, give up. You know your fast food or any of that. People want to continue to eat that. You can. It may have other issues, but getting the dyes out of there could very well change the percent. We, we have got so many kiddos right now and adults, but so many the Gen Zs that are becoming adults and our and adults uh, have the highest rate of depression, suicide. They have a shorter life expectancy than the previous generations because of suicide. And how much of it, how much of it is affected? All of it? No, definitely not going to pl blame all of the problems in the world on dyes. However, it's a piece of the puzzle that we need to remove because it's useless it's not doing anything for us other than tricking our eyes into thinking something's healthy when it's not is there a recognition among the healthcare community like <laughs> pediatricians primary care physicians uh, of this this conundrum i suppose that that they could be facing no no i've educated so many doctors uh we're lucky. We've had wonderful pediatricians. And when our insurance changed one year and we had to change pediatricians, which was heartbreaking for me, I had to call around and ask, so what are your, what are your views on artificial food dyes? Do you think they cause issues, behavioral issues? And I got a couple, oh no, they don't do anything. And I finally got a guy, a, a gentleman, a doctor who said, you know, it sounds like you know more about this than I do. And so I would love to talk to you about this and I would love to listen. And I went sold and he was, he was fantastic. And I've talked to my doctors. My doctors have all been on board because I've had to go to them and go, um, so I need you to put this in my chart. Every time you write a prescription for me, I need you to write, you know, across the bottom. Now the, the pharmacies, I have the local pharmacy here isn't too keen on me. They don't, you know, they're not very supportive of it. Uh, express scripts online medication. I talked to a pharmacist and he was telling me, oh yes, artificial colors can definitely cause behavioral problems in some people. And he was, you know, he was talking to me like, yes. So it's hit or miss. And, but it's out there. It's definitely out there. So the symposium that California Office of Health Hazard Assessment did was fantastic. They came out with a 300 page report. They took two years to come up with this report. And it's a 300 page document that analyzes over 90 studies. And their conclusion is there is an, is in fact enough evidence to support that artificial food dyes, synthetic food dyes can cause behavioral issues in some people. Hallelujah. Uh, Miller et al. 2022 did a meta-analysis of a bunch of research, came to the same conclusion. So we're getting some scientific evidence to support that, yes, this can be a thing. Do we need more research? Absolutely. Do we even know what dyes are in? No. There was one study done, Batata, Dr. Batata, and uh, I can't remember the other individual who did this. They looked at 810 products that were targeted, marketed towards children and what percentages of them have food dyes in them. And so we're becoming more aware. Dr. Stevens, 
Arnold, Arnold did conducted a research looking into percentages of dyes. So for example, if you have a kiddo who's sick and you get the liquid cold medicine, if you give it to them as prescribed, they are over the allowable daily limit within 24 hours. So how many kids are actually over the allowable daily limit? If you have a bowl of Fruit Loops, an orange crush, and I think some Cheetos, you're over the allowable daily limit, depending on how old you are. So, so some doctors understand this. A lot more doctors are are being open about it and or or open to knowing that they don't know. Do you know how many hours doctors get in nutritional training in med school? Fourteen. Fourteen hours. In all those years of med school. So they don't know. They're not. They're not up on what that. I had a pharmacist. We were in California. My son got sick. He needed a medication. It got called in and I went to go pick it up. And it says no artificial food, no, no synthetic food dies across the bottom of the, I mean, big, bold letters. So I pick it up and I go out to the car. I open it up and it's green. Ah. So I go back inside and I've talked to the pharmacist. And I was like, this says no synthetic food dyes. And he looks at me and he's a pharmacist with a degree in chemistry and says, well, what are synthetic food dyes? I said, do you have any pills that are white? The same one, but white? He said, yeah, I'm like, great. Can I have those? Just, just need the white ones. Now, is white always guaranteed to not have a color? No, but I did look up and the white versions did not have color. Uh, titanium dioxide is also listed as an artificial color. It is not petroleum based. It has its own set of possible cancer causing issues, but it is not petroleum based. It does not cause the same reactions in kiddos that the petroleum based colors do. So we opt for so the titanium dioxide over the petroleum based colorants in medications. So. So the long answer again is no. I don't think all doctors know, but but I'm hoping that they're more open. Yeah. Do you think there's any common characteristics that people who have sensitivities to artificial do dye, to artificial dyes might have? Uh, you mean in their reactions? Maybe in their reactions, or even like maybe. I guess maybe in their, their DNA. I, I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, an, there was an interesting study that was being conducted and I have not seen any of the published research. So I don't know if they found any correlation, but they were looking at, there is a polymorphic um, genetic variant on a specific gene that, that is the gene for allergies, like the codes for allergies that if somebody has this polymorphic variant, they could be more susceptible to having a dye reaction. Now, how do we know this without getting a full genetic testing done? We don't. So, uh, although there are, there do seem to be, so some kids also have, they have like eczema or eczema runs in the family. I have also found an interesting totally anecdotal correlation with celiac. So a lot of the families that I talk to, either the kiddo, the kiddo's parents or grandparents either have celiac or a gluten intolerance. So that's interesting. But they get totally anecdotal because there's been no massive research on this. Uh, so it could very well, or asthma. So it's the same gene that also codes for asthma or same, same genetic strand that codes for asthma. Um, so any, any allergies, people who have allergies could be more susceptible to also having a food dye allergy, uh, but we don't know for sure it would be great to do more research and find all of this out. 
I really, I really want answers to these questions. What does future research look like to you? What, what do you think the approach should be? Well, finding a way to understand the mechanism of what it does in the body. I would love to run my kiddo through a PET scan, spec scan, or an MRI to look at brain activity, off dyes and on dyes. And we're actually, we're trying to work on that. He agreed to do it. <laughs> uh, and, and now it's just coming up with a protocol and finding somebody who has one of those million dollar machines that I don't have and um, and, and doing that. But finding the mechanism of how it functions in the body, looking at, you know, doing more of the genetic testing, looking at individuals that we know have a dye reaction and seeing if we can break down, like, do they all share a commonality in their genetics? That would be great because then it might be easier to test for someone um, ahead of time or, you know, finding another way to test for it. Uh, the percentages of people, like how many people really are affected by this? And, and I, I think it's a lot more than the five to 7%. I don't want to exaggerate and say more, but what if it's 30%? What if it's so much more prevalent in our society than we know? Uh, so really looking at the mechanism of what it does or what it doesn't do and finding out how it affects the body and the brain, that would be a game changer. Does it interrupt the immune system in the brain? And I have a tendency to think that it does. Uh, there is a an amino acid complex, like a vitamin that we were taking through the pandemic. And it's, it's, uh, it's actually made locally, kind of locally to us. Um, and it's to boost your immune system, specifically the immune system in your brain. It's made up of amino acids and a bunch of other natural ingredients, all natural. And we have found that when we're having a dye reaction, if we take it, it knocks it down almost completely, like an antidote almost. It's been wonderful. The other day I had to go to the dentist and they had a numb, I wanted them to numb me up before they shot me up right? Because that's just the worst thing ever. And they said, well, this has red 40 in it. And so I'm like, ooh, pain or red 40. And I go home and I take a restore and I'm okay. I'm like, I will go with the Please numb me up and I will go home and I will take a risk. I will deal with the feeling of not being happy <laughs> and being angry and being uncomfortable and then take one and feel better. And so, so so it was interesting because it, it was designed to affect the immune system in the brain. It was not designed as an antidote for artificial dyes, but it seems to have that effect. Works like that for my son, works like that for anybody who I know has a dye reaction has taken it. Um, I had a parent go, oh, so they can just take that every day and eat dyes? No, 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 <laughs> no. But if I go to the dentist, I want to be numbed up before somebody sticks a needle in my mouth and... So I will come home and I will take it. Or if my son thinks he might have been accidentally dosed at a restaurant, he can come home and he can take a couple and he won't have the reaction. So it's it's nice as a um as a, a tertiary treatment, but it's definitely not it's definitely not something you would just take every day and then you'll be fine. Um, and then you can just eat all the dye in the world. It's not how this works. I wish, but that's no, not how this works. Um, but, uh, but it just, it does make me think that it, it does affect the immune system and it does affect the brain. We just don't know how yet. So that, that's the research that we need. We need to understand the how, the what and how. As a parent who has coped with it, what's your advice to somebody like me? I have a three-year-old who I know for a fact is sensitive to at least red 40 and we're sort of testing all the others. What's your advice for coping with, with this? Uh, grace and patience and understanding. Understanding that it's not 
they're not doing this on purpose, that they are overwhelmed and that they are, it's like taking big feels and turning them up to 10, to 20, to a hundred over what their capacity to deal with is. And, and so, and to know that they're going to accidentally get dosed, no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, someone's going to give them an m M&M m or they're going to go, oh no, these don't have colors in it. And it does. And then learning to recognize the behaviors and then learning to help them recover from that. And then teaching them how to identify it so that the kiddos can be their own advocates. And, and cause they're the ones that feel it. Once my son knew what was causing all of that horrible feeling in him, he was like, the, he was the biggest advocate. I'd be like, oh, go look, this doesn't have dye in it. He'd be like, let me see. It's not that he didn't trust me. It's just a he, mm, let me see. I have to read this with my own eyes. I brought home cookies that had no color in them, but they were colorful. They was all natural. And he wouldn't, he's like, I'm not eating that. It looked too colorful. I'm not eating that. Every time something looks too colorful, he's like, mm, no. Cause he knows he knew, he knew at seven, he knew at eight, he knew at nine, he knew what was going on after that. And so helping kids to recognize it and identify it and, and helping them educate the people around them. And, and, and you'll get the pushback. You've probably seen it. And it usually comes from family. It's really interesting. My mom kind of argued with me and then gave them a red vine. And or two or five, I don't even know how many he had. And she calls me and she's like, well, he just ran around in circles, screaming in the living room and then passed out on the floor. So I guess he won't be getting any more of those. Really? Thank you for figuring that out. I could have told you, but, but how, you know, you're going to have the difficult conversations. People are going to look at you like you're crazy. I have a PhD and people look at me like I am nuts. Like, I might be crazy, but this is not around this, right? I'm like, I know what I'm talking about. And you're, you're, you're just going to have to be that advocate and really dig deep into that advocacy and fight for your kids. And if it means going up against people at school about, no, this is not okay. So uh, some, some places are like, well, it's not an allergy because it doesn't cause anaphylactic shock. Okay. Well, I go get allergy medication because the hay fever, that's not anaphylactic, but that's an allergy. So an allergy is literally anything that causes a physiological change in the body when the substance is introduced. So this idea that it has to cause death is that's extreme. That's, that doesn't, that's not the marker for what an allergy is. So fighting for having it listed as an allergy on their records. And, and if that means you have to change a doctor until you find a doctor who's going to listen to you, I'm sorry, but that's what you're going to have to do. That means calling the pharmacy and spending five hours with the pharmacy and the doctor back and forth, trying to find a medication that doesn't have color. That's what you're going to have to do. And you, you, and then helping them as they, as they go, you're, you're, your little one. You're just, you get to explain to them that these make you feel not okay. And we don't want to eat anything that makes you feel not okay. And it gives them agency and it gives them that control over themselves and that empowerment to say, no, I can't have that because that doesn't make me feel okay. Um, I have found when we go to restaurants, I used to say, well, he has an allergy to red to, to colors. And then I would notice that some people that, you know, can you check on this or that? And they wouldn't take me seriously. And I said, so then I started saying, um, it causes psychosis and he has psychotic events and they, oh, they take that seriously, which it it's true. It does cause psychosis. Um, but yeah, people will take it seriously when you put it that way. So definitely having the difficult conversations with family and, and you can say, you cannot agree with this. And it, it doesn't cause a problem with you. And that's fantastic. I'm so, every time someone says, well, it doesn't cause a problem with me. I'm like, I'm so, I'm honestly very happy for you. My husband doesn't cause a problem with him. I'm thrilled because I don't want anyone to feel like this. And until it's out of our food supply, we have to be aware. So 
So I don't want anyone to feel like this. So people who say, oh, it doesn't bother me. Great. I'm so glad it doesn't bother you, but it does bother my child. And so I have to protect my child and we have to help them grow up to be the best that they could possibly be. And if that means they don't eat any M&Ms, that means they don't eat M&Ms. If it means they don't eat jelly beans, it means they don't eat jelly beans. There's natural versions of jelly beans. There's natural versions of the, of M&M type candies. It's just going that extra. Now I feel terrible for anybody who is in the low socioeconomic status households because they are extremely disadvantaged in this school foods have it. So you can protect them all day long. They go to school and they need to be eating the foods at school. They're going to get it at school. That's why what California is doing is groundbreaking and it's fantastic. When you don't have, when you live in food deserts, when you, when you don't have options, what are you supposed to do? And so I try advocating all the time for those individuals who are going to be hurt the most. And those are our, our minority populations, our, our people that are under the poverty line, our, you know, single moms that are doing the best they can, but can't afford all the different foods that, that don't have the colors in them. Um, and I will keep advocating because the only way those people are going to be helped is what, if we pull it out of our food supply. So, so yeah, just being an advocate and being, giving that kiddo some space to have all of their, their meltdowns while they're going through it and then helping them process what they're going through. It's a trauma. It is a truly a trauma. And, and when we understand that they're not doing to it on purpose, they're not doing it on purpose. They're not throwing these fits on purpose. Um, it takes the the anger and the frustration away as a parent and it, it replaces it with that that concern and that you know fear for our child yeah it, it every time my son has a reaction it instead of being frustrated it makes me kind of sad because i know yeah. that he is dealing with something that he he can't comprehend he doesn't know how to move through it and um yeah. Yeah, that that's really what started us down this road of researching and trying to figure it out because we know that it it's impacting him. He's three years old and he describes it. Um, you mentioned that your your son described it as buzzing. Um, mm -hmm. My son Jack he describes it as like a burning sensation in in like his his like throat and in the back of his head. Like he's three, so he doesn't have a whole lot mm -hmm. of you know vocabulary yeah. to express it but that's mm -hmm. the closest thing he can he can grasp and it it, it just kills us yeah my son used yeah. to say his body was felt like he was on fire and i would take his temperature and it wasn't any different but he said he would felt like he was on fire from the inside out and so yeah and his throat's burning and which definitely points to an allergy too right because your throat can sometimes burn on an allergy but the back of your right. head you don't think of burning in the back of your head. And that's his, that's that your brain's on fire, you know? And yeah, you, you just, your heart breaks. So, so yeah, by talking to him and explaining to him. So like when, when we eat certain things, it causes, you know, when you eat your body breaks it down and it comes out, you know, in your poop and you, you know, like you work in the poop discussion, but when you eat these, it goes to your, your brain and it causes all these feelings that you have right here. And so it's okay. Know that those feelings are, are just because of this and they'll go away because really once kids understand, okay, this is going to go away. Even my son, he can be raging from yellow. And as soon as I go, uh, you ate yellow yesterday and here it is, and then he'll go, okay. And then he'll go to his room and he'll, he'll calm himself down because he will remind himself, okay, this isn't real. This isn't real. This is a reaction. And I just need to get through the reaction and then I'll be okay. And so that has really helped him uh, bridge that for a couple of days um, before the restore. But yeah, it would help him bridge that. So, so yeah, just kind of teaching the kids, like 
this is what happens when, when you, when he eats that and maybe he'll grow out of it one day. I will cross my fingers for you, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hope. It'd be interesting well, to see who else in your family reacts. It, it, it's entirely possible. I, I think back to some of the things that I've dealt with in in my life up to now, and I wonder if perhaps I have sensitive sensitivity to the food dyes as well. My my wife actually was like, "Hey, you know what? I think that one time you had like Swedish fish or something, and you freaked out." Mm -hmm. I was like, hmm. it could be. Yeah. Right. So. Well, you can yeah. give it a shot. Yeah. It takes a couple of weeks. It's two weeks. It's right. You just remove it. How, when you removed it from his diet, like, did you see any changes? Like how long did it take? I would say two weeks for yeah. a complete change. Um, mm -hmm. After a couple of days, you see sort of like this, like a, a like a reduction in what, what I would refer to as his stress level or his, mm -hmm. his, his behavioral problems. But after two weeks, it just seems like he was a different person. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He was, he was him, which is yeah. so fantastic to see them as them and not that. Yeah. So two weeks, that's pretty much what I tell people is mostly it's two weeks. Just test it out for two weeks, but you can't have a drop, nothing, none of it. So I, I tell people to go through your house, put X's on anything that has color in it. Synthetic dyes, just the red 40, yellow five, a, a number name and number and and then don't touch it you don't have to throw it out because if you're not reacting then you know, don't you don't have to waste food but mark it everybody avoid it and turn it into a game in the family and then see so it's different and if anything's different and you'd be surprised i was surprised i knew for about 10 years my kid was reacting and never thought I was surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bevins. I, I really appreciate it. It's really eye opening to talk to you and I'm glad that I stumbled across your Ted talk. <laughs> um, is there anything else you think you want to impart on the folks listening? Anything I missed, anything that you, you want to leave, uh, leave, leave us with. Uh, no, I think I've asked a lot of great questions. Just knowing and understanding that just testing it out, seeing if it's causing any issues and then going from there. If it's not, go back to what you're doing. And if it is, then adjust accordingly because it's, it's better for everyone if we're not eating something that we're allergic to, right? You know? Like I can't do milk anymore. And as much as I'd love to have it, I know what's going to do to me. And, and so knowing that there's something that could be causing a problem with you, and then you can be more intentional for yourself and for the kids and possibly happier. And, and don't we all deserve that? Not just the kids, the adults deserve it too. So giving it a, giving it a shot and testing it out and, and going from there. It's not impossible anymore. It's not ridiculously difficult. I have a house full of food and none of it has color in it. And there's replacements for just about everything. And, um, and kids can live, you know, I've had people say to me, Oh, like, Oh, you're giving them food issues of food avoidance issues and things I'm like, no, no, my, my, my kiddo, loves he's a foodie oh my gosh he's a foodie loves food loves expensive food and um but so there's there's plenty of a variety in the world and in our country that doesn't have dyes in it so it's it's definitely not he doesn't he doesn't suffer um and so kids aren't it's not it's not going to cause a kid to suffer so kid they'll, they'll everybody will be okay and then buy the dye free stuff and help us advocate, <laughs> help us get it out of the food supply. Cause it just doesn't need to be there. The UK is doing just fine without it. So we could do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but thank you. Again. Thank, 
thank yeah. you. Thanks for, for bringing me on and having the conversation. I think the more that we talk about it, the more we pass on that education and maybe the happier some kids could be. Yeah. And adults. Yeah. yeah. That's thank the dream. You. So thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.